Right, good morning folks. Welcome to the second talk uh, in, uh, of the day. Um, with us today is uh, James Smith. I'm not going to do a full introduction. He already spoke yesterday. Um, and I'll leave uh, the introduction to anyone other than me. Um, he's going to be speaking to us about unit testing on an astronomical scale. Uh, my, uh, my test, is that working? Yeah. Okay. Now let's plug in the HDMI again and see if it does the crash things. Okay, that's good. So I changed my title to software testing at an astronomical scale because I wanted to talk about unit testing ori originally, but I'm, I'm excluding that. Um, so uh, by way of introduction, um, I'm assuming that the, the audience uh, by viewing this talk is normally familiar with the idea of software testing, um, the reasons why we might do it, and the associated benefits that might come uh, from it. And at least to the passing familiarity with some of the tools that are available uh, at our disposal. So the one that I'm going to sort of focus on is PyTest, and the sort of jargon and terminology that, I've, that I'll use uh, is somewhat PyTest specific, but the concepts do translate to other packages as well. Um, so it's, it's it's not really unique, but I like PyTest. I think it's, it works very well. But there are others. Okay, so I'm going to start with the conclusion. Um, I think that just makes things easier uh, so that we know the butler did it so we can get on with enjoying the story uh, a little bit more. What I'd like to kind of take away from this session is that testing in general is a great concept and we should all do it. Um, that, that's the first point. And number two, the methodology and the tools can be applied to much bigger systems than just little pieces of code. You can test bigger systems as well, and even things that are not on your computer. Uh, if you provide it, you can talk to it, you can test it. Okay, a little bit of background. Um, I, I spoke about uh, a lot of uh, makeup related stuff yesterday, but the benefit of those who are not uh, in my talk. Um, Meerkat is a radio telescope. Uh, it's currently doing great science in the year of Cape, and it's getting an extension. Uh, we're going to get uh, 15 or 20 more antennas and along the baselines to do better science. The correlator is the part which digitally combines signals from all the individual antennas. And uh, the one that we're building for Meerkat Extension is for possibly the world's first real-time correlator, mostly written in entirely in Python, almost entirely. There's a little bit of CUDA uh, doing the, the hard work, but most of the rest of it is Python. Okay, so I need to stay a little bit closer. All right. Okay, so if you know, uh, so this is a, this is a sort of a diagram of a, the context of a correlator might have in an astronomical signal chain. Um, the the digitizers are the first thing. They're, they're the what uh, you get a an electromagnetic um, sort of radiation from the universe, and your antenna converts that into a a voltage signal, your digitizers will then digitize that voltage signal and pr provide the input to the correlator over here. The correlator does some signal processing uh, activities and then this gets stored in basically an archive uh, at which time uh, the scientists can actually do their, their work. If you're familiar with data science, data engineering, the digitizer does the E part, the extract, the correlator does the T part, the transform, the archive is the L, and then your uh, data scientists and analysts and whatever the case is do what they need to do with the data that's stored there in a very clean and sanitized fashion. Um, so just to put you in a little bit of context for the, um, uh, for, the for the problem at hand. Um, and this is a picture of Meerkat's correlator. Uh, so it's, it's not a, uh, a, mon a monolithic thing. There are roughly 280 individual processing nodes here. They're, they're A platforms and they're cross-carrots. 
And there is the well, redundant master controllers, the, the available servers that um, that basically control and assign the processing tasks and manage and, and orchestrate the tasks that the scanners uh, actually uh, perform. So um, there's lots of functionality to verify to make sure that it actually works. Uh, there's many opportunities for things to go wrong. The interface between the correlator and the digitizers, the interface between the correlator and the downstream uh, data subscribers, the um, uh, interface with control and monitoring systems, and then even within the system, we have many of our own internal interfaces that, that need to be made sure that, that they work. I'm going to take a little bit of a sidestep at the moment, and I'm going to talk about systems engineering, a, a term that some of you may be familiar with, and yesterday someone said I used the word FPGA and that gave uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I hope that doesn't um, happen when I talk about systems engineering today. Um, but it is a formal discipline for designing and managing complex systems over their uh, life, life cycle. Um, it started at Bell Labs in the 40s, and it was heavily influenced since then uh, by military procurement and, and procedures and that sort of thing. So. It is typically quite document heavy compared with uh, some of us who prefer to operate in a bit more of a fast and loose fashion. One of the, uh, there's a, I also make typos here. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, one of the, the documents that we need to produce um, as a result of this system engineering process when we're designing the system, well, particularly the, the, I mean, the telescope and its subsystems, is a qualification report. Um, now that does that, that basically is written evidence that the system that you have produced meets the spec when it goes to this world's design. I don't know if you've ever used PyTest. Uh, it runs and if there's no problems, it just exits and doesn't say anything. Or it will give you a little green line saying everything's good, test passed in seven seconds, or whatever the case is. That's not good enough uh, for systems engineers. Uh, we need measurements, we need graphs, we need tables, we need lots of stuff. Basically evidence of the test procedures that we've run through and the results that we got and how that uh, meets the requirements. To show evidence that your system actually meets the spec uh, that it was required to in the first place. Uh, it's, a, it's a very rigorous system. It's important if you want to build large and complex systems that are going to work uh, for a long time. Particularly in situations where people's lives are at stake. In radio astronomy, that's not really the case, but lots of money is at stake because the equipment is expensive, so we want to do it properly. Um, it's quite boring to do it manually, but tools like PyTest can still help. So, uh, I, I was going to talk a bit about unit tests, uh, but uh, I, I wondered if I might not have time for that. So, I'm going to focus on the system level testing aspect of this. Uh, and I, I think it's interesting that we know, if, we, if, you did, if you've done software development for a while, you know about the concept of unit tests. You've got to take every little piece of your code and make sure that it does the thing that you think it does. Um, but I, I don't know how often we test uh, a system as a whole, particularly if that system is not just a software one, if there are other components, other aspects to it. So, what do we test when we test our correlator when we do the qualification. Among other things, this is a non-exhaustive list, uh, the correctness of the signal processing. So if we multiply numbers together, do we get the right output? Uh, have we, uh, you know, have we um, implemented our Fourier analysis properly? All these kinds of things. It's easy to make mistakes. Um, response to control inputs. So if you tell the correlator to do something, does it actually register and do the right thing? Um, a correct reporting of internal states. So if you, uh, if there's, uh, if, the, if there's if, um, errors or um, uh, missing uh, information or something that goes wrong internally, is it actually properly reported to the to the outside world? Fault handling. Um, what does it do when packets are locked, for argument's sake? Uh, and ultimately anything that is uh, in the specifications document. So if, if your spec says that you need to do this, you need to have some sort of a way to prove that uh, that it, it works according to the requirement. So how do we do it? So here's a, a, a set of sort of general principles that we've been using. 
Number one, don't reinvent the wheel, or in this case, the test framework. PyTest works. It works very, very well. Um, but there are a few things that you do need to invent. First, you need to have a representative test system. So ideally, this your, your dev environment, your test environment, should be as close to your production environment as is feasible. Uh, in our case, okay, I'll show you a picture in a little while, we have smaller test systems that uh, are functionally the same, but not at the same scale as what we deploy on site, but they're, they're quite representative. You need a mechanism to communicate with this system. This could be uh, via an API, it could be uh, via some other sort of network protocol, it could be by USB or serial. If you can talk to your system in some way, programmatically, then you can use PyTest to test it. You need controlled deterministic inputs and environments if that's important. Uh, you, uh, we have had, not the correlator uh, as such, but we have had systems in the past where we've tested using uh, things like, uh, I'm trying to forget, I'm trying to remember what, what term for this thing was, but it was basically a big oven to uh, simulate the thermal cycling that uh, components would endure in the Karoo. So that's something that we, uh, that we use. In a correlator, we don't do that because it's just living in the data center environment. You need to have some way to measure the outputs of your testing, and you need to have a standard or an ideal uh, requirement against which you compare these results. So these are our examples. Uh, I showed the picture of the correlator earlier. That's a, that's Vecat's correlator. Vecat extensions one I can't show you because we haven't bought it yet. Um, but here on the left is the is a, a bunch of, uh, of servers that have big DPG GPUs in them, and on the right there is uh, I think these are ten or twelve scarabs and a little sort of test control computer that we have, which uh, both these are situated in our lab uh, in Cape Town. So the rest of the stuff is done uh, in code using PyTest, and the thing in PyTest that does the hard work is called a fixture. Now, this is a great concept. Uh, if you have a, a, a test that you want to um, run, you have a, a device that needs to undergo a certain sort of number of tests. Uh, you want to start from a, a sort of a known state in each, each time. You don't want to have a subsequent test depend on something that happened previously. So PyTest pictures do that. So we have a fixture to, for example, start and control a correlator. For each test, a correlator gets started up, and the fixture returns a, a remote control, which is this little object that gives you um, kind of like an API, the ability to interact with that correlator while it's running. So for each test, you get a brand new one to make sure that your state is clean and your part, passing or failing of the test is not reliant on something weird that you might have done previously in the previous test. Um, we have a fixture to start and control a digitizer simulator. So this is a, uh, a computer that pretends to be a digitizer and, and composes uh, input data that's deterministic that we can control uh, so that we can test the response of the correlator to that. We have a fixture to receive the correlator output and we have a fixture to generate pages and pages and pages worth of documentation. Much easier than doing it by hand. So, procedures and reports, one uh, point on those. Uh, detailed test procedures are an aspect of the systems engineering process. Usually you should start on these kinds of things early. Uh, while you're busy with proposing a design, uh, you'll also propose um, some sort of procedure for uh, proving that that design that, you, that you're going to embark on is how, once you've built it, how you're going to test it. Um, this is in normal cases, a separate test document. But the approach that we've taken is to let the test scripts be the test procedure document uh, and interleaving our code with pros describing how we're uh, performing the test, thereby min minimizing drifts. I have had a case of, well, to use, um, to use Steve Johan's phrase, I can neither confirm nor deny that I've uh, read test documents or test procedure documents years after they were written and thought to myself, this is, in, this is not at all reflective of how we actually test these things. Um, so yeah, it's better to, uh, to have your, your procedures 
and your documents as close to your actual uh, implementation as possible so that you can make sure that, that you know, if, if something does need to change, then everything can be done in harmony and according to the right procedures. Uh, okay, and the same procedure or the same PyTest picture that's used for these procedures also produces the reports afterwards. So to demonstrate what I mean, I'm going to go through a bit of an example. And uh, this is uh, linearity, the, a test for linearity. So this is, linearity is the sort of um, property of the system where the outputs are directly proportional to the inputs. So if you have an input that's twice, twice as big, you should have an output that's exactly twice as big as well. So PyTest uh, tests take the form of Python functions. The, they just have test underscore at the beginning of the name. And the arguments are either parameters or fixtures. In this case, we don't have any parameters. Uh, we're just running through the test once. So the, the fi this fixture here, correlator, uh, hang on, uh, starts uh, correlator, gives us a, a link to control it, and when the test is finished, it will close it down. Um, this one gives us the ability to receive the, um, the output from that correlator, and the um, and this one gives us uh, yeah the PDF reporter. So here's an example of what I was talking about. PDF report dot step. We, so we start with the propose uh, with the pros. So we select a range of, of scales for testing. So we're starting from. Okay, so this is uh, 0.5 to the power of i for i in range 10. So it's decreasing there. The report. The reporter will detail what we've just done. We do a little bit more preparation. We're selecting a frequency channel um, and reporting it. We're setting up the gain for the equalizers. So this compute tone gain is a sort of a common pattern in testing, so it's abstracted away into a function. We can just use that. And setting the gain of the correlator. Um, sample tone response. So this is a, a common pattern. If you set up a deterministic input, you're expecting an output you've got to get the correlator to do that. So that, that um, boring boilerplate is abstracted away in this function. And what we've given is the base correlation products, the, the output of the correlator for the given input that we wanted. Um, I just select the, the, only the frequency channel that, uh, that we were testing, because we don't need, need the whole band. Then we do a little bit of preliminary calculation. Uh, the correlator will give you an output in uh, power scale. We need it in voltage scale, so we just do a square root to get to get back the voltage scale, complete linearity. Then we do some statistics and RMS, a mean squared error. Uh, then we generate a plot. So this is a, a cool trick. Um, I, I should take a step back and explain this PDF report. It's a little bit misnamed. Uh, when I built it initially, I wanted to generate a PDF straight away, and I used PyLate, PyLatex, and I thought it was really clever. But then I realized that if there was like a problem with formatting, or I wanted to change the table, or something like that, I needed to rerun the whole test. Um, so version two of this of this fixture uses an intermediate step, so the data gets dumped as JSON, um, uh, or should I say, serialized and stored on on the drive somewhere, and in another pipeline. Uh, another stage in the pipeline takes this and renders it as a report. So that if I do need to tweak something um, uh, with formatting or a font or something like that, I don't need to rerun the whole test. I can just modify the script and use that, um, that JSON input. Uh, and so if you didn't know this, um, Matplotlib also has a backend where you can serialize uh, a text plot into, into JSON and you can use it in, um, in LaTeX later on which is quite nice. So this is the output. Uh, it's got a bunch of cool things that happen automatically every time you run a test. Uh, the first section is the requirements that are verified. Uh, this, um, this linearity test is just an informal kind of thumbs up one which we use as a first line of, is, is this thing actually working? So there's no actual requirements uh, verified here, but if they were, they would be listed in this section. It tells us exactly what configuration we were running. So. Um, I forgot to tell it what my name is, so it thinks I'm unknown. But the, the git info of all of the software packages that were involved and the hosts that the correlator would run on, this gets typically rendered onto an A4 sheet of paper, uh, which is difficult to um, 
to display in any sort of meaningful way. So you'll please accept my butcher screenshots there running off the edge of the page. Uh, this, the next section tells you just a little bit about the correlator that was run, its configuration, and where the different software components, the pipeline stages, will run on which computers. Um, and then finally, the detailed test results. Uh, a summary of the test, a summary of its outcome, how long it took. Um, and as I mentioned, these are the various steps of the, of the test. So this becomes our, our detailed test procedure. And with the results reported at the same time. And a nice plot, uh, which this is ultimately this is really, if someone who's reading this report, they always just turn to the plot first. And if that looks right, then we have to sign off the document. But the rest of the stuff needs to be there for reference uh, in case something happens. OK, winding up. Um, uh, testing like this has lots of benefits. <coughs> we can we, we can find problems before they go out in the wild. Um, this does involve con um, confronting unpleasant realities. Because you're, if something doesn't work, you can't ignore it. Your test will tell you that it doesn't work. You need to fix it. Um, this has helped us in the past. Uh, it's it's far better to, to deal with these things uh, during the workday from 9 to 4 than to get uh, a phone call from a crazed operator at 2 o'clock in the morning saying the correlator is broken. I don't know what to do now. Um, ask me how I know. Um, there's for some, for some reason it's always the correlator. Um, and it continues to do so. So interestingly, before we came to Durban, uh, our automated tests revealed that some change we had made in the last week or two uh, broke things and things are getting stuck. And of course, this would happen uh, on the afternoon just before I'm trying to get, uh, if I need to get on the plane. So that's something that I'm looking forward to when I, <laughs> when I get home. But that's fine. It means it's doing its job. The other, the other value of, of having a, uh, a set of tests like this that I don't think we often think about is the, the value to, to collaborators and potential collaborators. So you can, if you want to, and I can, uh, if you're interested in doing that, get in, get in touch with me, you can run a mini version of this on your laptop uh, with Docker. Obviously, it greatly reduced, but if you have a GPU, your laptop, by the way, and if you want with, with tensor cores. So there, there are some, so there are some requirements, but, uh, but it's, it, is, it is reasonably in reach. Um, so that allows uh, co potential collaborators to play with the code, see what happens, uh, you know, the influence of, of changes uh, that they could possibly make affecting the output. But it also increases the, the visibility and transparency in the scientific process. So uh, those that are downstream consumers of the things that our correlator produces, if they have some sort of question as to, you know, what was the DSP doing, then they can get the code for themselves, they can examine it, they can interrogate it, they can generate one of these reports for themselves and see, you know, if they can, uh, if they have a, improvement, they're welcome to su submit it to us um, as well. So in conclusion, uh, testing, it's not just for little code snippets, you can test big things as well. And uh, that's it, that was, I seem to have taken less time than I expected to, but thank you. <laughs> how, how much time do I have left? Okay. So. I can, I can take questions, or I, I can possibly look at a little bit of unit testing now, uh, if, if anyone is interested. But in the meantime, yeah, are there any questions? Um, yeah, so we, uh, that's quite a, ch a challenging one. So code coverage, um, there's, there's two sections to this. So I'm going to show you, uh, this, is, this is sort of the layout of our repo, and, and PyTest stuff is in a folder called test, which is quite normal. But we have an extra one here called qualification. So this is just a normal um, uh, this is just a normal PyTest sort of environment, and this will this will run while we talk. Um, uh, and and uh, I 
forgot to use the cup option there, but it can generate a coverage report. Qualification is a bit different because it doesn't test the code as itself here. What it does is it talks to our correlator system and invokes stuff there. So we don't necessarily have direct uh, uh, insight into what code is running. Um, so I, I can't I can't just give you a number. Uh, it, um, it it kind of depends. You need to look at it intelligently. The other aspect to it is that a lot of this code is either JIT compiled or um, or it's CUDA. And normal coverage tools, the Python ones at any, at any rate, can't, don't, don't really know how to, how to understand that. So I, I do use a tool like coverage to see you know, if there's a change, is, the, is it going up or down? And I like the fact that it highlights which parts do and don't get, get tested. Um, so then I, as the human being, can actually apply some judgment to that. But I can't, I can't give you a hard pass number. Yeah. Have you used um, Parsis and um, some of our vendor applications that have used to get the coverage of all the parts of the up here to Yeah, I've, I've seen that with some other um, open source projects that they'll, and there'll be a cover alls or a coverage bot or something like that, and it'll complain that the coverage has gone down like by minus zero, zero eight percent or something like that. But for me, the, the number is not important. It's it's what the what the underlying um, actual report is telling you that. Because uh, we've got to give it to engineers for signing. Uh, it, that, that's not a bad. It's not a bad idea, and I'm not necessarily opposed to it. But the the thing that it's that it's doing is replacing us having to type these documents and submit them to the relevant stakeholders by hand. A database might actually be a more intelligent uh, way to do it, but then the, the stakeholders involved would actually need to understand how to interrogate that database um, and get some report from it. But that's that's a good, a good idea. That's, that's a suggestion that I'll make. So, Meerkat Extensions Correlator is still in development, um, but for, for Meerkat, we had a, a similar system. It wasn't using PyTest because it's that old, it was using Node. Um, and all the, you'd think that the qualification report would come right at the end of the process, and it does, but often the end of the process isn't quite what you might think. That it is. It's not the end. So, the, there'll be a, a, a you know, an engineering change proposal, we need to add this feature, or we've discovered a bug and we need to, to fix it. And once you change some aspect of the system, the qualification tests need to be run again to make sure that the change or the new feature that you've implemented hasn't broken anything else. So um, so it ends up getting run more frequently than, than what you might think. And so, I mean, we, the, the system that we're working on now is, is fairly mature, but it's still kind of in, in beta. Uh, so we are running the qualification tests quite frequently. So uh, one GPU can do the work of more or less four scarabs. Uh, so for 200, well, 208, the, the first system that we're building will, do, will be 50 GPUs. Um, there's we don't need all 280 of them, so the, the most that you should be able to use at any given time are, I think, 120, 192. There's a, quite a bit of uh, sort of spare capacity in the Scarab correlator. Uh, with the GPU correlator, we, we reckon we'd need about 40 of them to run the, car, the, the antenna, the telescope at its max capacity. So we have 10 spares. Well. We don't have them. We've ordered them. We'll, wait. we'll see how long it actually takes to get them. Ah, that's a very good question. Um, so, coming back to the, the system engineering concept, and uh, my, my boss is a system engineer, he's not here, so if I butcher this, he won't uh, get angry with me. Um, 
But a lot of the functionality of a system is often as a result of what we call emergent properties. So if you think of uh, your legs as a system for walking, the requirements is you must be able to walk. Your knee is a system, is a, is a component of that system, and you can test, like, can it articulate on a, in a certain axis? But walking is not a pro property of your knee or of your thigh muscle. Your, the muscle, the only thing that it can do is pull in a certain direction. So walking is an emergent property that only happens when all of the components are working together. Uh, so that's not something that you can test on a unit level. Um, the other... The other interesting thing is um, you often get, uh, if, you're, if you're testing in a unit environment, you have to mock stuff out that are the interfaces with things that are not in your system. So for example, an issue that I had with this one, um, the receivers, so the, the, the components of the, um, of the correlator that do the, the ingest of, um, of data from, from the network. Uh, when you're running unit tests, you don't have a network, so you've got a, you use Mocha or um, Monkey Patch. I forget which one of those two modules, but that functionality kind of creates a dummy that feeds you data so that you can test the rest of the logic of your system. I made a change to these things, and I thought that I was very clever because all the unit tests were fast. But it turns out that I wasn't very clever because the part that I made changes to was actually mocked out, so that unit tests weren't testing that at all. But that did emerge once we started doing a system test, which tested the whole thing from end to end. And it just crashed spectacular, spectacularly, and then you know, I had to figure out why. Uh, and then it turns out that I wasn't that, that clever. So yeah, those, those, those two reasons, I think, are, are why you would test at a system level as well as at a unit level. You wouldn't do it as often, so you would run your unit tests like probably, well, depending on, on uh, what you're working on, probably every few hours, whatever. So your, your, your system level tests might be on a longer time scale, but before you, you sort of merge any major change in, you, you would do a system level test as well. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, someone who's previously read many of these uh, test reports, uh, it's refreshing to see that uh, with the, the, the extension you guys are satisfy a particular requirement. Mm -hmm. And what I found in the past was that uh, these are actually the tests that uh, provide a lot of information that solve issues on the system level. Mm -hmm. um, have you guys found out a way or an easier way to, to feed that, um, those tests um, back through the, the, the system engineering process to be able to identify the requirements on the system level? Yeah. That's, that's a hard question, Suleiman. Um, what you're asking is more of a human question than a technical one. Um, one of the issues that we have in Surreo is that our system engineers just like leave and work for City of Cape Town instead. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, the, the, we're in we're in a situation at the moment, just in strictly in terms of Meerkat extension, that we we haven't had as much interaction with the system engineering. Uh, Sort of aspect as we'd like, just because of resource constraints and these kinds of things. Uh, so this has been mostly sort of an, an, an internal iteration kind of thing. Okay. Uh, we haven't had it reviewed on, our, on a system level yet, but when that happens, I'm sure we, we'll start doing more, more work about that. Okay. So yeah. Right. And just a second question: um, those tests that fail but don't have a specific requirement, mm -hmm. um, as a whole, do you still classify that as a pass? So the one, like for example, the one that I showed you doesn't have necessarily a pass or a fail criteria. Um, and this is uh, just a, a linearity thing and it, and it will tell you unless things are so bad that you know, the whole thing crashes and breaks, the PyTest will just report pass because nothing, there was no assertion that failed and no exceptions and what have you. 
Um, but if we look at this graph and we see that it's going off on a, like a exponential tangent or something like that, like, then we'll know like, okay, there's something wrong here. So, but that hasn't happened yet so far, fortunately. A question from you, James. Um, so you mentioned one of your tests uh, was passing at unit test level once you started doing the system test and integration test and then you get the failures. Like, as a mechanical question, how do you go about figuring where the problem lies in the test? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the answer to that is get bisect. I'm not, is, just, is anyone familiar with that? Uh, Git Bisect. So Git is probably my second favorite piece of software in the whole world, the other being the kernel, and they're both written by Linus Torvalds, so he's my hero. Um, so what Git Bisect does is it lets you do a binary search on your code. So if you know that a problem was introduced at some point, it helps you find it. So you tell me, Git, that this commit is bad, but I know that this commit in the past was good, and it cuts it in half. So what's in the middle? So you check out that part, and then you test there, and if you still, if it's good, then your, your problem space is reduced in half. If it's bad, then the, the thing that made the change is probably you know, there. And you repeat that process until you find the commit that was, um, uh, that, that introduced the problem. And so uh, that sounds easy and straightforward. It's not, always, it's not always as such, but in this case, that's what it was. So I, I could able to see, ah, when I, when I did this, uh, it broke things. I didn't immediately know why, and it required a bit more experimentation, but at least I know what I did that, that broke the system. So, sure. Any other questions? Uh, well, I mean, it, I, I think we've basically covered the, the concept. Uh, I can show you a little bit more what, what unit testing looks like, but I, I think we're good. Unless there's anything anyone has an appetite to look at GPU code, but probably not. We don't want to give anyone PTSD today. All right, Jen, thank you very much. Thanks.